Brandon Munro. How are you, sir? I'm well, thanks, Matt. How are you doing? Glad to hear. Are you sure? I thought you'd be de- depressed and curled up in a corner. Uranium markets gone to ha- hell in a bucket. Ah, that's just a spot price. I wouldn't worry too much about that. It's a big <laughs> driver for investors. But uh, you look at the fundamentals, everything's still really strong. You've got a term contract price that's going the other direction. This is noise at the edges, and I think it's important that people understand that. It is noise at the edges, and I'm just joshing, uh, as they say here. Yeah, I know, but in all all seriousness, I think people are a little bit confused as to how to read the market at the moment. So uh, they thought the price would go hurtling higher forever and that equities were the main beneficiaries of that. Um, the, the truth is we've, we've, we've reset. I'm using this phrase, pregnant pause. We've got to, we've got to see, um, why it happened, what's happening. And, you know, hopefully get an understanding of when it will move again. So, I mean, how, how do you read the situation? What, what, what was the reset? What was that caused by? So first point is, um, obviously, we were joking a bit before. You can't be flippant about the spot price because it does play a role. It certainly plays a role in investor sentiment, a very strong one, particularly for investors who've got a shorter-term outlook. Um, It plays a role in the interest of financial investors into the sector. Uh, And it does ultimately play a role to the types of terms and conditions you can negotiate in a long-term contract, although... That is where I make the point that it's short-term noise at the edges. Uh, the utilities are far more um, concerned about the longer-term trends than what we might see over a period of weeks. Nonetheless, it's been really volatile. You know, in the last six weeks, it's dropped from a bit below $110 to now mid-80s. So that is a big drop. To understand and interpret that drop, the first principle is that it's in very low volumes. Uh, that volume is about 40% less than this time last year. And this is not a traditionally high volume time. You know, that in, that time period includes the after Christmas period. So it's usually a relatively low volume. And now we're experiencing very low volumes. Now, the other thing is one of the major consultants in the industry put out some analysis saying that 86% of that spot price volume is actually what we call in the industry, churning. So only less than 15% of those spot market transactions were between a seller and an end user. In other words, a utility who's buying that material to put in a reactor. So first principle, it's very, very thin. So significant demand, as we saw on the way up, affects the price and moves it very quickly. But equally, if there's some significant supply or a motivated seller, it moves it quickly on the other side when there's not a reason for one of those market intermediaries, read speculators, to want to jump into the market. The word on the street is that there's uh, a very small number of players who are looking to take profits. There's nothing immediately on the radar that would uh, give a good reason to a seller of uranium to uh, a buyer of a uranium to want to really hang in there. And so uh, the buyers have been able to retreat and have the sellers follow them down. And that's where we find ourselves. Um, a lot of the speculation on the way up was to do with Kazatomprom announcing that they uh, were going to be curtailing production or changing their production guidance from what they were planning on achieving. That is now out there. The excitement of it has normalised. And then the other news that was helping it push through $100 a pound was that an expectation that the Senate in the US would pass the um, prohibiting Russian uranium imports bill. Now, that's still working its way through. They've got various machinations that are moving that forward. And the view in the industry is it will still pass. It's just that it's not in coming days. So um, if you're a buyer of uranium, you're likely to hold back and let the sellers come towards you rather than having a good reason to get get in and get your orders done right now. The reason why the, uh, why the lack of liquidity, apart from simply the volatility that it introduces up and down, the reason why we got there with the lack of liquidity is that utilities don't want to be pushing a spot market right now for obvious reasons. They're the end use customers. And we're in a very curious situation in uranium because the three biggest sellers in the sector, being Kazatomprom, Cameco, and Arano, 
Well, they don't want to put push the spot price right now either because they might find themselves needing to buy in the spot market to fulfill their contracts. And uh, as we've heard from Cameco, they're looking to identify other routes to obtain additional pounds rather than the spot market. So it's a very curious position where essentially neither side of the equation wants to see a spot market go up right now. However, the long-term contracting situation is very different and the fundamentals in the sector speak for themselves still. So spot price might have come down significantly, but the demand picture has only grown in credibility in that intervening six weeks. And that's what really the long-term producers are looking at. That's what the utilities are looking at. And over that period, whilst the spot price has come down, the reported long-term contract prices has gone up by $3 to $75 a pound. That's right. So we've, we've, um, we've talked in the past about buyer's market, seller's market. Kind of slightly confused at the moment as to, as to what it is because you've got, you've got sellers who are also buyers Influencing, influencing the market greatly because they want to, I guess, win on both sides of the equation. So it makes me think, well, how do so few players influence the pricing in the market? I mean, I know we're in a small sector. There's a very small sector. I, get, I understand that. And I kind of, you know, it has a pluses and minuses. I think the, the, the minuses are that you can have players like, Cameco, Kazatom from Arano, you know, even metal traders, quite frankly, uh, influencing price so dramatically with so few pounds. Um, it also makes it, it also on the negative side, makes it harder for people to kind of look in and go, I've got a handle on this, um, this, this sector, um, because it's, they're going to be put off by the fact that it's so small and you've got players that can ch- you know, chase the market so dramatically. So do you think that, do you think they'll ever, work it's ever sort itself out i mean there's this he, he, he's he should how do, i guess what i'm trying to work at is how do we get a much smoother more steady state a creative growth in this space which attracts big money attracts money to feel and makes money feel comfortable that they're not going to be manipulated in some way is that possible yeah look i think it is possible it's still It's still got a long way to go, but there have been a number of improvements over the last few years. Um, Only two or three years ago, the month-end smash was a regular part of this sector where traders were able to manipulate the price according to whatever the um, time frame on their larger delivery contracts was, and there wasn't the liquidity to do that. Now, in recent times, and I'd probably exclude the last six weeks, as I've said from this, but... Over the last couple of years, we have seen enough volume going through the spot market, including contributions from the Spot Physical Uranium Trust, that uh, that wasn't an effective way to handle the spot market. So we're in a temporary phase where there isn't a lot of liquidity. Uh, That will resolve itself. Uh, From an investor's point of view, that represents more upside than downside because if you were to take a medium-term view of what's going to become, which side of the equation is more likely to be compelled to buy, well, it's the buy side, not the sell side. Compelled to act, I should say. It's the buy side compelled to buy rather than the sell side compared to sell. And you say, well, why would that be? Well, the reality is there's very few sellers out there who can be compelled to sell into the spot market. The supply of production into the spot market has dropped a lot. It's now traders who are handling just about all of the producer-related production. And it wasn't that long ago that BHP just sold its material straight into the spot market. Navoy Mining from Uzbekistan just sold their material straight into the spot market. Now they're selling it through traders, and there's talk of BHP re-establishing a marketing arm. The reason it's important with traders is these traders have been already managing that material into the market. And so they don't need to sell the material the moment it hits the converter onto the spot market. So that might they might be the parties compelled to sell. Um, in the times of excess inventory, those, there were lots of parties who would have felt a degree of pressure to sell. That doesn't exist anymore. And then on the buyer side, well, you've clearly got the potential for traders finding themselves compelled to buy. 
uh, over time, you'll have utilities who see value in buying and become motivated that way. And then finally, at some point, broader equities markets are going to improve. The appetite for risk assets on uh, stock exchange traded uh, markets is going to improve. And you'll see money flow into the spot physical uranium trust and other financial buyers. And as we know, they are an indiscriminate compelled buyer once they have um, traded and issued units through their at-the-market facility and put themselves in a position where they need to reinvest that cash into uranium. So that's why I say I see the uh, the probability is weighted in favour of liquidity working in our favour as an investor, as a uranium investor, um, even though it feels a bit sore at the moment for investors out there seeing a spot price come down from some pretty supported levels above $100 a pound now into the 80s. Okay. Let, let's, let's address a, a, a topic which has been you know, circulating around for the last year, you know, three, four weeks, which is around comparisons to the lithium market, the way that that kind of exploded out of the gate. So by uh, by in 2022, lithium romped its way from, you know, 20000 bucks up to 80000 uh, bucks by the end of the year and then kind of fell down, you know, last year. Back down to, and, and and through into this year, we're sitting you know sitting around sort of twelve to fifteen, well twelve to fourteen thousand bucks, right? It, it's come way off, and people are saying, "Well, hang on, isn't that just what lithium's doing?" And I want to sort of go through the argument as to why it's not a fair comparison. One, I think with lithium, in lithium's case, we saw a slew of companies coming on. Quite a few of them were you know claiming to be able to supply the world's entire lithium needs. And yet, kind of coming off of the thematic, as it were, EV car manufacturers were saying, well, actually, maybe we won't produce as many, and maybe internal combustion engines is part of the solution going forward. So, I think in terms of the demand side of the story, it kind of crumbled. And I think the supply side of the story, it kind of got a little bit frothy. So, so that's lithium, uranium. I don't think we can. Uh, we need to argue too much for the case for demand in the sense that we've got more reactors being built. We've got SMR, small modular reactors, um, being um, talked about and designed for for different use cases. You've got ex- extensions on this. So on the demand side, it's solid and growing. So that's not the bit that, we're, that I, I think we need to spend too much time on. Okay, the bit I I am. In, intrigued by because it can drive equity prices is how much supply is actually new supply is going to come on on market you you obviously chairman of a uh advanced development story um in namibia um but there there are other advanced development stories out there not so many um yet we're not seeing those sort of moves yet i think with uh, too many of those moves we've seen sort of encore Coming alive, we've got UR Energy pretty, pretty, pretty close, and we've got others talking about it. So, it's even if all of those stories, advanced developer stories, I've talked about getting into production, including yourselves, it's quite soon. Even if they do, we're still way, way short, it, it seems. So, I'd be intrigued to two things. One, um, how do you see the supply coming in, into market? And two, what's the effect then on equity prices? And therefore, you know, my chance to win, my chance to make money. Well, I think you've said it quite well, Matt, that assuming all of the restarts and all of the advanced Greenfields developers that are permitted to come in do come in, that still doesn't solve the problem. It still doesn't meet demand that's required. So the risk is very much to the downside on supply because history in any sector, in particular uranium, tells us that you can't expect an 100% show up rate for restarts and for Greenfields developers. You know, it's very challenging out there. Uh, And just to draw a bit of a starker comparison between lithium demand and uranium demand, remember the uranium demand is absolutely baked in because these are multi-billion dollar installations that are absolutely reliant on uranium as the unsubstitutable, unsubstitutable fuel source. That's different to next year projections for EVs, for example. You can still have sales falter. You can still have sales expectations falter. You can still see big shifts from, say, the US to China in terms of supply and demand. You don't see that in uranium. We've seen that twice in the last 30 years. 
Um, and even then, it wasn't quite as dramatic as that. So this is demand that is absolutely there that's not conditional on EV uptick or anything else like that. It's just simply conditional on the world, more or less, continuing in the way that it is at the moment. Um, so from that supply point of view, if this pricing has not altered the supply picture, which it hasn't, then it tells you something as an investor and it tells you it's not pricing that is uh, the bottleneck in supply. It is permitting, it's the quality of technical work that's done around the place, it's the capacity of management teams um, and it's political constraints mixed up with sometimes environmental and social constraints around the world on different permit, uh, different projects that limit their capacity to go forward. And that's why, and we see it because I'm talking to investors the whole time as Bannerman Energy and the feedback that investors are constantly giving me is, well, you guys are so unique. You've got scale and you're fully permitted and you've done all of your engineering, including feed work, and now you're ready to go just as soon as you get financing. That's maybe not absolutely unique, but it's highly unusual. This is such an important sector in the world, nuclear power, and yet there's less than a handful of companies who are in that position to meet this widening supply gap. Yeah, it's, 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 I, th I think it's, and it's just, in, just in terms of that kind of second bit of that question, which is, you know, what, what's the upside, what's the benefit to me um, as an investor um, of this, the fact that the new supply, not re not resource, but new supply, taking its time coming into the marketplace. I mean, do you think I'll I'll get a win out of that? Does that help me? Yeah, definitely. Because, as I say, the risk is to slower and less than what you would reasonably expect, or what most parties are modelling as being the supply case over the next several years. Um, and as an investor, you're also in a position to decide where you want to weight your uranium portfolio and uh, you can weight it in terms of the developers who you've got more confidence in uh, and as long as um, you know as long as they're capable of delivering then you'll do proportionately better if they're not capable of delivering well again you can hedge your portfolio with uh, producers who don't have uh, ceilings on their position and so if your developer doesn't come in, well, you're kind of hedged because the uranium uh, market will continue to be supported and the price will go up. And that's and we're trying to sit between those two in Bannerman where, as you know, we are totally unaligned at the moment. We don't have any strategic holders on our register. As in industry holders, we've not committed any of our production yet because we believe that the market's getting tenser and that uh, terms and conditions will improve further with long-term contracts, but we're ready to go. So um, that's a lot of the reason why we're seeing, for example, the institutional conversations that I've been having over the last few days. That's why they're particularly interested to talk to me about the Bannerman story. And, and, and um, I mean, you and Deep Yellow say similar, similar types of philosophies in, in, in a way, in the sense that, you know, I'll let the market come to me. Uh, I'm not going to go rushing, rushing out and kind of give away some of the upside, um, you know, early. But at the same time, you've got to be, you've got one eye on financing of, of capex, et cetera. And we, we, we've talked in the past, you know, where's the best time to take money? Uh, it, it's when it's there. So you've got to be pretty darn sure that the market's going to be there when you need it to be. Um, I mean, how, how are you... I don't know what conversations you're 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 part, you're, you're part of or party to. Um, what are you hearing, seeing from the finance, financing side of things? Because it, it feels feels like there's a lot of new money looking in, but not necessarily doing anything at the moment. You look equity. There's a lot of money around. You know, we've seen it with the deep yellow raising that we've had this week. Very very well supported. Uh, and in my own conversations with the institutions, the constant theme is. They like uranium. They know they need to be positioned. They don't feel spo spoiled for choice. They feel like there's very limited number of products to choose from in terms of where they're going to put their uh, uranium money. And so that's why we're seeing ETFs grow so quickly because it's very easy, I think, for a sophisticated investor to identify the uranium theme as being attractive, you know, only more so with the spot price coming off and equities coming back a bit. It's not so easy, particularly if you're new to the sector, to know how to stock it. So 
what, what a lot of institutions are doing is they're putting it into the ETFs or they're putting it into the very biggest, most liquid names and then starting to catch up on the sector and starting to switch out as they develop a better understanding of particular companies. There are many of the conversations that I'm having at the moment. In terms of debt, you know, we were in Cape Town together last month. Uh, most of the uh, serious debt providers and credit funds and so on, they were there. Obviously, uranium was a, a theme of the month and they all wanted to talk to us. So there's a lot of appetite. Um, some of them, they just wanted to let us know that they can now lend into uranium. And of course, they're all comfortable with Namibia. So that that capital availability is there, but that's not quite the same thing as saying, yes, well, we're ready to do it. Uh, we're very fortunate in that we've got a number of different options and we expect that the financing equation is not just, we're not just limited to one or two plain vanilla options. Our, our project is very attractive to industry players because it's simple, it's very large, it's a very long life asset, it's got the ability to expand, so they feel like if they need to double down um, into receiving uranium supply from our asset because the market tightens and it does what we think it will, they like the fact that we can increase our production once we're operating and profitable. Um, everyone's comfortable with Namibia because it's been feeding the nuclear industry for more than 45 years through Rio Tinto at the Rossing Uranium Mine. It, so all of those factors mean that industry players are interested in a tango and that gives us a range of different options beyond just simply going to a syndicate of banks for your 60 70% and then going to the market for your 30 or 40% of the equity. Our job as a management team and a board is to get that mix right and to play out that wide spectrum of options and then decide what's going to be best for shareholders. And if the best thing for shareholders is to wait a little bit longer, well, we've done that for some time and we've put ourselves in a strong position to be patient. We've got a big cash balance, $35 million at the end of last year. We've got a technical program where we can keep the asset moving forward um, using that cash balance. So we're not consuming development time. Uh, and we've got a register who's realized that a little bit of patience has added a lot of shareholder value over the last six months. Uh, they understand that we didn't rush in and sign contracts as soon as it was economic to do that. And uh, I think our register trusts that we understand the sector well enough uh, that we'll uh, do a good job of optimizing the timing and that balance between as the contracting sector moves from a strong buyer's market over the uranium shortage into a seller's market. It's moving that way, there's no doubt, but I don't feel like the sector is operating in a seller's market when it comes to term contracting. And that would be the optimum time for us to get involved. Okay, so that's it. that seems very, very focused. But I, want, but I want to talk to you about some of the stuff we see elsewhere in the sector where companies buy, buy assets, do deals, merge, all, lots, lots, of, lots of things like that to just stay relevant and maybe newsworthy and maybe drum up some excitement. Um, I think there are some strategic activities we've seen. I think if I look at like Boss and Encore, for instance, or, or even um, your, your, your friends, uh, you know, Deep Yellow with their acquisition of, of Malka Rock and Alligator River, um, you know, last year. As a as an investor, I'm just trying to work out what's a genuinely strategic, important, relevant move for a company, and what is just white noise because we're just trying to, you know. Keep keep the keep uh, you know front of mind, um, but may not necessarily have any intrinsic value. So you know, you, and you're you're sort of I guess in the middle there. Where you're saying no, we've got a job to do here. We are very much focused on getting um, this project, this very big project, over the line and not get distracted. So so how do you how are you going to read those market moves by companies? Well, look, we're in an unusual situation. We've got the luxury of being focused on one project because our pipeline is built into the project. You know, the, the holy grail in for a junior uranium company is to have a pipeline. You've got a near-term asset. You can contract and start delivering into that near-term near -term asset, and then you've got another project that you can go and develop 
leverage off your existing production, your existing contracts with customers, your existing finance, your relationships to develop that project. Now, I, I can make the argument that we've got a superior form of that because it's simply an expansion of our existing mind. So we know the ore body by then will be in production, will be profitable, uh, we'll have a much lower risk profile because it's an existing operation, we'll have existing relationships, all of that sort of thing. So it's an easier form of developing a second pipeline asset than a Greenfields development somewhere else. Um, but we're a bit unusual like that. So that's why I can be focused and I can be patient and I can be very disciplined about m and uh, For a lot of other companies, uh, they don't have that luxury. In, in fact, just about all companies don't have that particular type of luxury. So um, you then say, well, what are the justifications that aren't just simply the white noise of trying to beat up market interest? And now the, the one that really... Um, is important is what I described in terms of having a pipeline. If you're a near-term developer, particularly if you don't have a very long mine life, uh, you want to be able to s start putting in place the steps to having longer-term relevance now because that will affect your ability to write contracts with utilities. And equally, if you're a, if you're a CEO of a, let's say, an early to mid-stage explorer, well, you've still got a long way to go ahead of you. And if you can join forces with someone who's got relevance in that intervening period, then it's quite a neat mix. Um, the, the other thing is that there is a strong strategic rationale from shareholders' perspective that we've seen deployed quite a bit in the sector, which is bigger means more liquidity, which means more availability to ETFs. Um, which means, generally speaking, driving a lower cost of capital. Um, that's driven some of the uh, consolidations, but I think that'll become a much bigger driver of consolidations. And if we go back to our earlier conversation, there's a lot of investors who have realised that uranium, the nuclear thematic via uranium, is one of, if not the most attractive thematics in the broader resources sector right now. Now they're looking, well, how do we play that? You either play it by the ETFs or you play it by the biggest, most liquid players. And slowly that filters down. So for somebody, and a good example is Deep Yellow merging with Vimy. They became bigger. There were some advantages because Deep Yellow's management team were able to provide a lot of operational experience to the asset. But fundamentally, it was one plus one equaled two, uh, two and a half because they then push themselves up into greater liquidity, a bigger market cap, more access to institutional investors, and therefore uh, they were able to um, achieve a greater share price appreciation. We'll see a lot more of that, particularly amongst smaller companies. It's really hard out there if you're a 50 or $100 million company. This is a big player sector. And even for us, uh, sitting just below $500 million Australian, I think if if we didn't have the management that we have, it would be a disadvantage to us. We're just fortunate that we've got really good people in the key roles at the moment. It'd be hard competing on the open market right now for good people as a relatively small company. I mean, we, we could go on and maybe talk, talk about some of the new entrants that are coming in, into the space and you know, collect, you know, collective, um, collectively what that is worth and lessons learned from last cycle, et cetera, but maybe save that for another day. Um, look, I, th I think it's pretty quiet out there, um, Brandon. I think people do want to sit back and see who's what, what's going to happen with, with spot price. I want to see if you know D utilities get a little bit more active. Um, yeah, and I, I, I don't, I don't blame them, but uh, I think it's patience. Is we bring bring back that word again? Patience required here. Um, if you're a holder, and perhaps if you are not yet in. Quite a good time because I think most companies have had a little reset on the equities um, front, despite the fundamentals not really changing. Um, I think that's sentiment driven rather than you know the, the reality of the situation we see in front of us. So I, I think it's a, a good time. Um, we we go again, I suspect. Um, I don't know when, but we will. The, the, it will go again uh, for for sure. Do you think we're kind of seeing the the, the best of it? Let's say that you know, you know, am I getting in a little bit too late? I'll see some upside. But will I see? Will I do as well as the people have been in maybe for the last year? Well, it depends on what risk 
price you paid for that in the sense of, so Bannerman shareholders who got in in the last year have doubled their money. But a year ago, we didn't have the same level of assurance of the thematic that we do at the moment. You know, it's sitting a lot of equities at the moment. It's pretty easy to see a pathway to a 50% growth in share price over over a relatively short period of time. Um, in many cases, equities have already, already retraced 25 or 30% just this year on the back of the poor sentiment that you referred to. Um, so on a risk-weighted basis, I'd argue the, the opportunity is just as good now as it was a year ago. There was a lot more uncertainty back then, um, and now you've got more certainty. You've been able to see the market play out a bit, and it could be still, a, in my opinion, they're nowhere near overcooked for this sector. So there's still a lot of headroom that you can grow into as an income investor. Interesting times. Interesting times uh, indeed. Well, look, um, Braden, um, we will speak to you again soon. Um, obviously, it's getting busy at your end, so perhaps not as regularly as, as, as uh, we, we used to see you, but definitely as valuable every time we do. So I appreciate your time today, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Matt. Always a pleasure.